So we want to just take a moment here and, and recap from last week and pick up. And we are in the church age. We talked about the seven ages, starting in the Garden of Eden, the age of innocence. If, if you wrote that down, it's, it's not critical. But just know now that we are in the church age. Hallelujah. That's the dispensation that we're in. And it's interesting. I'm going to read to you uh, in Ephesians here, chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. It says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So this, he's talking about a mystery. And when the scripture talks about mystery, know this, it's not something hidden from us. It's something that was hidden for us. This is something, this mystery that was not understood in the previous ages, in the previous dispensations, but is revealed now in this age, in the church age. He said, in which other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given to me by the effecting, effective working of his power. Hallelujah. And then he goes on to say in verse 9, he said, To make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, from which from the beginning of the ages has been give, hidden in God, who created all things through Christ. So he's talking about the mystery of the church. The mystery of the church. And that was revealed to Paul. This mystery, this, this church age, and we talked about there is the universal church. Every believer in heaven and on earth is part of the universal church. Every Christian. But then the scripture talks about the local church. This is the local church. And as, as you study the New Testament, you'll find that out of about 114, 115 times that the church is mentioned, 90 of the times, by far the majority of the times... It's talking about the local church, not the universal church. Again, it's talking about the local church. And as we continue to study, we'll see that God is very much aware of the local church. He recognizes local churches. We see in the book of Revelation. He, he lists out the different churches. He knows each one. He knows Faith Life Family Church. He knows the members of this body. He recognizes you as part of this body. It's not just, oh, you know, we're just all part of the universal church. Some Christians have that mentality. And, well, um, well, we'll talk more about that in a moment. So the focus is on the local church. Uh, 90 times out of 114. Hallelujah. And then we talked about the meaning of the word ecclesia. Or ecclesia, however you pronounce, choose to pronounce it. We're not speaking Greek here. And so we're not going to, you know, uh, split hairs. But the wor that word refers to an assembly summoned by God. It's not just a group of people who decided to get together and have church. The church is God's idea. The church, the local church is God's plan. And we respond to him and are called by him to be part of a local church. Nobody, no believer is just called to be part of the universal church. Every believer is to be part of a local church. Hallelujah. So we are summoned 
by God. He's the one that's called us. In essence, the church, the ecclesia, is a body of people, not so much assembling because they have chosen to come together, but assembling because God has called them to himself. Not so much assembling to share their own thoughts and opinions, but assembling to listen to the voice of God. The church is a group of people who have heard the call of God and have come together under the unction and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. You may not know why you're there, but that's why you're there. That's why we're here. God has called us. He has drawn you by his spirit. Amen. The Holy Ghost always leads us into the plan and purposes of God. Amen. Hallelujah. You're not meeting with a group so that God can be part of your plan. He has brought you together to be a part of his plan. The reason we say this is that sometimes believers don't want to emphasize the local church. They just want to talk about the universal church. They believe you don't really don't need to have a pastor in your life or a place where you come together with the same group of saints on a regular basis. They can just go to a coffee shop and talk about Jesus with a couple of friends and have church. Mm. It's wonderful to get together with friends and talk about Jesus, coffee shop or wherever, not knocking that, but that is not the local church. That's good. That's good. Hallelujah. God calls us together with a purpose, and he places a leader, a local pastor, to oversee Come on. the local body. Mm -hmm. Amen? And so you can see there's so many ways that natural thinking enter in, and it robs people of the blessing that God intends there to be in a local church in a local body now think about that for a moment God recognizes you if this is where he's placed you God recognizes the place that you have in this body the scripture clearly uses our physical body as an illustration and he talks about the body all the parts fitted together as it pleases him when you were formed in your mother's womb, your mother didn't decide how you'd be put together. Did she? No, well, say, well, it was in the genes. No, God said, I knew you. Before you were born, mm -hmm. I knew you. Before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. Right. Your body is put together according to God's design and purpose. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen? And so as a local body, when he has called us together, each one has an important part. There's things that God has placed on the inside of you as a supply. In other words, you're useful. You have a purpose in the local church. Well, I mean, no matter who we are, our greatest fulfillment is knowing what we're part of. We all want to be part of something that's greater than ourself. Amen? And that is fulfilled in the local church. Again, natural thinking will just get us messed up. And one of, really, one of the greatest misunderstandings about the local church is not recognizing the supernatural nature of this assembly. We are called here in a supernatural way. Some people think, well, you know, I'm just going down the road and y'all have a good sign there and it looked like, you know, it looks nice. I'm going to go try that church. When really as a believer, the first thing we do is say, God, where is my place? Where do you want me to be? He knows where your supply is. He knows where the supply that he's put in you fits. And we simply say, Lord, I want to be where you want me. You show me where I'm to be, and Father, I'll be there. That, that's the first step in, in getting into your place. 
And, and I, I like this illustration I've used before. My, my right ear is here for a purpose. And the supply for this ear is in one place. Connected right here. You know, you put it on my shoulder back over here, it wouldn't function. It would be of no use. Maybe a little bit of shoulder pad once in a while. Lean on. <laughs> no. But when it's right here, man, I'll tell you what, what a blessing it is. And so that's the way we need to see ourselves as believers that I have a place God's called me to be. And I'm going to be faithful to stay in my place so that I can be blessed, but so that I can be the blessing he's called me to be. I mentioned this last week that our place in the local church is like being on the launch pad at NASA. Before the shuttle or rocket takes place, there's much preparation and supply that's done. Before that rocket or that shuttle launches on its mission. And so in the local church is where your supply is for your mission. And, and that mission... And, you know, it doesn't mean that everybody gets launched off as somewhere else in the world. Some do. But some, your mission is here. In Warner Robins, Georgia, Houston County, or whatever. Your mission, what God has called you to, is here. I heard somebody say, and, and I, I, I know, we both know, sometimes it takes more faith to stay than it does to go. Because we all want to go do, you know, great things for God and go off and do this big thing for God and do that. But when God has called us to a place, that's the greatest thing. Amen. And so recognizing where your supply is, getting on the launch pad and allowing God to launch you into what he's called you to do. It's the most satisfying thing. It's where your heart desire, heart's desire is fulfilled. Amen? Hallelujah. So one of our big misunderstandings is not recognizing the inherent spiritual nature of a local church. Supernatural nature. Recognizing that each week God has summoned us together. Amen? In Hebrews 10.25, it talks about uh, not forsaking the gathering of ourselves together. I'm sure y'all, many of you are familiar with that scripture. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. One translation, or one, one of the meanings in that word forsake is to neglect. To neglect. So, kind of a thought here, neglect, like if, you know, you, you were to neglect, neglect a child, it, it's leaving them on their own to survive. Right? Or, or abandonment. And so that meaning is in there when it says don't forsake. He's, God's saying don't abandon the local body. Sometimes we think, oh, well, you know, they'll be fine without me. Church doesn't need me. Uh, that's not what God said. But see, that's how sometimes our natural thinking about the local church can mess us up. That thought that the church will be fine without me is this thinking fails to realize that each member, each one of you, has a significant part. We need you. Listen, I need you. And if I need you, God needs you. I'll never forget one of the tremendous testimonies Brother Hagin used to share when he was pastoring in the oil fields of Texas way back in the day. And uh, one, of the, one of his church members, I believe it, it was his Sunday school superintendent. Sometimes he's had so many stories, uh, get them mixed up a little bit. But one of his church members, a man in his church, was working on an oil field around some piece of equipment. And he fell down into the equipment and it just, it just messed him up. Just messed him up bad. And so the man is in the hospital and he's just just hanging on just by just about nothing and uh, could just die at any time. Just his body was just pummeled by this machinery. 
and Brother Hagin's praying. And he's pleading his case. He's saying, Lord, this man is faithful in my church. He's the Sunday school superintendent. And he's been doing a good job. And I need him. And said, Lord, he's one of the biggest givers in the church. He gives about a, a third of his income, which makes up almost a third of the income of the church. And said, Lord, we need that. I need that. Lord, if I need it, this church is yours. If I need him, you need him. And Brother Hagin was just pleading his case. Well, the man had checked out. He'd, he went to heaven. And he was up with Jesus. And Jesus said, you know, you can't come now. You're going to have to go back. And so Jesus kind of pulled back a curtain. The man was telling, told this after he came back. Pulled back a curtain, and the man could see Jesus in the uh, brother Hagin in the hallway. He said, "Lord, I'm going. I'm not going to let him go. I need him, and if I need him, you need him. I'm not going to let him go." Well, the man came back. Of course, he was supernaturally, spectacularly healed. And just in a day or two, they he was out of the hospital. The doctors were just like, you know, we had multiple bones broken and crushed up and broken internally, completely healed. Hallelujah. He was part of a local church. I would dare say if he hadn't been part of that church, he wouldn't have made it. Why? There would have been nobody to plead his case. Amen. So God honored Brother Hagin's faith there. That man had a part. He was a part of that body. And that local body was important to God. You and your part, you're important to God. You're important to the plan of God here in Warner Robins. That's why he has you here. Amen? Do you see how sometimes just natural, just approaching church from a natural mindset will miss out on what God has? Often it's not that people make a conscious decision not to go to church, but rather they neglect to go. You know how it is, you know. They in, people intend to go, I'm planning on going, I can, but things get in the way. You know, priorities get scrambled, and they just say, well, you know, I'm not going to make it. And listen, there is no conda condemnation. We live in a real world, and there are times when things come up, we're, not, we're just not able to make it. Or if you're, you know, especially nowadays, you're under the weather, you're having some symptoms, please, Stay home. Amen. If you need somebody to pray for, we'll come to your house. But don't bring it here. Amen. There's times when you can't come. There's times when we all need a vacation. I guess you don't. Y'all just enjoy working all the time. There are times when we need a vacation. <laughs> Amen. And it's good to get away and, and rest and relax and get refreshed, you know. And, of course, when you do that, you, you can't come. To, that's, not, that's not what we're talking about. It's talking about just some, some folks make a habit of not coming to church. You'll see them once or twice in a month, you know, or they're just off and bopping about or they got, you know, family in town. I tell you what, when your family comes to town, bring them to church. They'll be blessed. I won't bite them, won't run them off. Now, I can't speak for you, but be nice. But amen. Hallelujah. Don't, don't neglect. Don't just see just the natural side of church. Natural thinking can hinder us by not understanding that God has summoned us, called us to assemble together in his presence, and that they're an essential part of that assembly. Some folks, maybe you've had somebody ask you, you go to church, why do you go to the church so much? Why do you go to church all the time? See, the world doesn't have a clue. They, they don't understand what God's doing in your life. They don't understand anything about the plans and purposes of God. So they're just going to be like, y'all, just crazy. You don't need to go to church all the time. We go at Christmas and Easter, and we're good. Yeah. You know, tell them, well, why don't you just why don't just you just eat on Christmas and Easter and see how you make it? Come on, that's good. I feel it. 
All right. No, we're being fed spiritually. Hallelujah. Thinking about Don. You know, the proverb says the spirit of a man will sustain him in infirmity. In other words, when your body is sick and weak, the spirit, your spirit man, you keep your spirit man strong. Amen. The word of God will speak to you when you're in a bad place. You know, that's a scripture. Choose life, isn't it? In Deuteronomy, God said, choose life. Well, what did he do? He chose life. <sighs> life. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Why do you go to church all the time? Because <laughs> I can't imagine not. God called me. God's got a plan that he's working in my life. Amen. Hallelujah. Being naturally minded can be a hindrance to you. Let me read to you Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 24. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18 through 24. And this is uh, the New King James. It says, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. This is talking about uh, when Moses went up on the mountain, right? And they said, don't nobody touch the mountain. Why? God was there. There was something supernatural, holy happening that God was doing. He said, well, you have not come to a mountain like that. He says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. The local church. This assembly is a sacred assembly. It is a holy thing. Hallelujah. The general assembly and church of the firstborn. Who's the firstborn? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's who is referring to. Who are registered in heaven. You are registered in heaven. Your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. God knows you. He has a plan for you. He has a place and a purpose for you. Amen. And in the church age, this era, this dispensation that we're in, God has a place for you. Not just in the universal amoebic out there. Yeah, we're all part. No, but he recognizes you as part of a body and in your place. Hallelujah. Registered in heaven to, the, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Abel. Hallelujah. So this is a sacred assembly that God has called us to. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Not only does natural thinking cause believers to forsake the assembling of themselves, of themselves together... It is also the reason behind the increasing casualness and worldliness of church services. Reading in Hebrews there, that this is a holy... Actually, the Old Testament referred to those assemblies back in that day, a holy convocation. Now, I'm not talking about we get together. Ooh. No, there's joy in the presence of God. And... See, some people think that joy and reverence is a contradiction, mm -hmm. that they're opposing thought. No, there is joy and reverence in the presence of God. Think about Moses on that mountain in God speaking. Think about the awesomeness of that, where they dare not even touch the mountain for reverence. 
See, but when we just come together and just, oh, when there's that casualness, that wrong thinking, then the casualness of the world comes into the church and begins to dilute. There is no longer a reverence for the presence of God. We lose sight of the purpose of why we're gathered here. We are gathered here to worship God. The, the, the thing in our day is, you know, we want to create uh, a worship experience for people when they come in. But there's no thought given to what is God experiencing? That's right. No. We aren't gathered together for you to have a worship experience. We are gathered together to worship God. And Jesus said, those that worship must worship in spirit and in truth. God called us. He summoned us to his presence to come together to worship him, to hear from him, for him to speak to us. Come on, somebody. When we fail to appreciate the amazing reality... That it is God summoning us, summoning us, or calling us to come into his presence. It becomes easy to think it's acceptable to simply come as you are. Mm-hmm. Now, listen. I'm talking about, as Christians, our attitude, our overall attitude toward, toward the things of God. When it comes to sinners, God says, come as you are. They're coming in from the world Come as you are. But as believers, we're to have a sense of reverence about the things of God, about this holy assembly. Hallelujah. To, again, talking about how we, be, how we believers approach the things of God, including our assembling together. Pastors and church leaders have failed to convey, convey to people that at a church service... That a church service is a holy assembly. Instead, they have led folks to believe that attending church is no different than going to a shopping mall, to the movies, or to a flea market. They say, come as you are. There is no need to make any special preparation. Mm. Well, you see how the thinking of the world has come in. It's just coming, oh yeah, there's no preparation. Wait a minute. If God is summoning us, He's calling us together. Then we begin to make preparation to respond to that summoning. And the first preparation that we make, ah, is right here in our heart. Lord, I'm I'm coming to get, you've called me. I'm coming to hear from you. Lord, I'm coming to worship you. See, that the, the beautiful thing about the corporate anointing. Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. See, modern church has completely lost sight of that fact. That Jesus said, there I am in the midst. When the reality of that really dawns on our hearts, we'll act just as though we would if he was here in the flesh in person. We'd be thinking about it all the way to church, wouldn't we? While we're getting ready, we're brushing our teeth, combing our hair. We're not just going to pull a pair of dirty jeans out of the hamper. Oh, these are still good. Do you understand the reverence that we have for who he is? He is the God who created the heavens and the earth. He created you and I. Hallelujah. Oh, and how he loves us. How he loves for us to come into his presence. We are to be just children coming into father's house. Yes. Uh, But the kids don't come into the house with mud on their shoes. And and, and dirty, they don't come. I know we didn't come to the dinner table with dirty hands. We've been out playing in the pond and doing it. No, we cleaned up. Amen. Well, there's that same sense. I'm not talking about, we're, we're not here. I'm not telling anybody how to dress. Not telling you go buy a three piece suit. 
I'll, I'll just be honest. You, you, know, wanna, you wanna know why I wear a, a coat and a tie? I don't have my coat on this morning, but why I dress? Because God called me to be the leader of this assembly. That I'm not just here as Dave. I'm in the office of the pastor. And I, in my heart, I've got to honor that office, that place that God has called me to. I, I have to be honorable. It is, it is as more or more honorable office than the office of the president of the United States. Y'all, or at least some of y'all elected him, chose him. Maybe you didn't. But God called me. And I'm going to treat the office Come on. with reverence. Come on. I'm not just going to joke about it. And I'm not going to get up here with my favorite jeans and tennis shoes and just be cool and casual. I need to be honorable because I'm speaking for God. I don't know if you can appreciate that or not. But hopefully at some point you can. Hallelujah. In the Old Testament, I mentioned that Israel was instructed to observe the Sabbath and certain feasts which were described as holy convocations. God gave very specific instructions about these sacred assemblies, detailing what and how sacrifices were to be offered and even how the priests were to be dressed. They always came with the commandment that the people were to do no customary work on those days. That is, the congregation of Israel was to, set, was to set itself apart from natural things in preparation for assembling in God's presence. Now, we don't have sacrifices. We're no longer under the law. But once again, there are principles in the word of God that do not change. And one of those principles is that we always honor him. Honor. Why do we meet on Sunday? It's, well, it's just the tradition. Well, really, Sunday is the first day of the week. Now, if we, could, if we needed to meet on Monday or some other day, that's fine. But really, Sunday is the first day of the week. And if we can, we want to give God the first part of our week. Mm -hmm. But see, the natural thinking is, oh, well, you know, I like my weekends. My weekends. And so, yeah, if church, if they, want, if they can have an early service, that way I can get in. I go to church early and have the rest of the day for myself. So who do you really belong to anyway? Where is the, the, the honor for God in your life? Where is the reverence for the things of God where you set time apart? Quality, your best time. If I'm going to give him the best of my substance, then I've got to give him the best of my time too. Otherwise, I, I'm just halfway there. Listen, y'all, this, this is not, I'm not preaching law. I, I'm preaching love. When you love God, you honor him. When you love God, you put him first. When you love God, you don't want anything in your life that displeases him. When you love God, you always do your best for him. When you love God, you take this temple that he's given you. And you take care of it. The scripture says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Hallelujah. I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm just saying what the word of God says. Don't shoot the messenger. If you have a problem, take it up with him. And if you still got a question, if you don't see this in the word, come talk to me. I'm, I'm here. We are touchable. Amen. But if you can see it, if you can hear the heart, if you can see the spirit in which we're talking here. Amen. God loves us. He wants to move in our midst. But we can't have an attitude of this is convenient for me. If this fits me, that's good. No. 
There's coming a day when we'll stand before him face to face. But do understand, really, you're standing before him now. I'm standing before him now, aren't I? Well, that helps me. The scripture says that he that has this hope purifies himself. Amen? And when, when we get our, our minds straight, our thinking right, and we come into the presence of God with reverence, joyful singing, happy music, mm -hmm. heaven is happy. Amen? I'll tell you what, we'll see God move. We'll experience the things of God when we come together like never before. Amen? Amen. I need to wrap this up here for today. We're just going to unhook. Hallelujah. Amen. In, a, in today, wor, today's world of media saturation, it's impossible to ignore the latest worship gimmicks. Like the auto industry's early rollout, yearly rollout. You know, everything's doing better. I kind of like the new Corvettes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pretty awesome looking, aren't they? Everyone seems to be offering, all the churches, and offering a better and sexier church model. Come on. Right? Mm -hmm. But not everything new is necessarily improved. That's right. right? No, we want to stick with what the Word says. God is not, it's not all formality and law in order and you can't do this and you have to do that. When Jesus said we must worship in spirit and in truth, it's a heart issue. We're talking about the heart, our heart. Demi used to say, what about your heart? When she was sitting in a high chair. <laughs> that was a minute ago. <laughs> well, it's about our heart. And our attitude, listen to me, the attitude that we have toward the things of God. We don't fit him into our life. That's right. He is our life. I conform myself. I bring myself. I submit myself to his plan and purpose for my life. That's where the blessing is. That's where the joy is. That's where the peace is. That's where the fulfillment is. That's where the things that I can't even imagine, because they're so good and wonderful that God has for me, that's where they come to pass. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is this making sense to y'all? Again, the purpose here is not to boom, 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 you better come to church with your best on and your Sunday best. And a... No, that's not what we're saying. But come with an attitude. God has summoned me. I'm coming to worship. I'm coming to be with my church family, others that God has summoned us together to worship him. God is going to speak to us. In fact, I'm going to write it down when he does speak to me. It's that important to me. Just in the natural. You know, you tell some people some things and they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Okay, that's great. Uh-huh. Do you continue to share your heart with them? No. Proverbs says don't cast your pearls before swine. God is not going to give his most precious things to people that just treat it. Anyway. I knew when I was a kid growing up, thank God for good parents. Many times the things that I got coming were based on how I treated the things I had. I want to get a new bike. Well, you don't take care of the one you have. You just leave it laying out in the rain. Dave, go out and put your bike up. Just leave it laying out in the yard. Yeah. So, you know, well, I learned to take care of things. So that way when I wanted something new, my folks weren't feeling like they were just throwing it away. Well, he's just going to destroy it. He's going to leave it out there and like it's junk. No, I had to show appreciation for what I had. Well, that's a godly principle, isn't it? That's right. Let's show God appreciation for what we have. Let's begin to honor the assembling together. Come with that reverence, with that right thinking, and you watch. 
will see the things of God. You'll begin to see the things of God like never before. The scripture will come alive to you. You won't ever leave a church service without having something. Man, I got to write this down. That is, you won't. God is, God is that good. He'll do that for you every time. Why? Because you show him that you appreciate mm -hmm. what he gives you. And you, you treat it with respect and, and value. Woo! Hallelujah. hallelujah. I don't know about y'all. I just feel so anointed right now. <laughs> Maybe you don't. <laughs> hallelujah. I pray that you do. I have an expectation. The plan and purpose of God for our church is coming to pass. That means the plan and purpose of God for you, for our assembly, is coming to it shall surely all come to pass. Everything that he said, the dreams and purposes that he's put in your heart, they'll come to pass. He'll bring it to pass. Amen. But let's make some adjustments. Let's be a strong local church. Let's be a body of believers who knows our purpose, who knows that we've been summoned together, who know that God has called us and has a purpose to accomplish in this city. Yes. Hallelujah. Listen, we don't have to be the biggest church to have the most effect. That's right. That's right. I said we don't have to be the biggest church to have the most effect. Hallelujah. We have to do our part. That's right. Amen. We're only accountable for our part. For, for being faithful what he's called us to do. That's right. We're not accountable to have, you know, a 10,000 seat auditorium. If that's what God has, if that's where he calls us, hallelujah. That's right. But we're going to be faithful in the little things, in the small things. Be faithful with your heart and your family, helping your family, especially these youngins. Teach them to honor God. Teach them to be reverent toward the things of God. Amen. And it'll pay. Godliness is profitable. Amen. Thank you, Father.